Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar entitled The Cost of Success, How to Deal with High Feed Prices. This webinar is brought to you by Wisenetics. My name is Barry Bradford, and I'll be your host today. The topic of our meeting today is the current enemy of every dairy farm out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, every livestock farm, and that's high feed prices. And we're very pleased to have a great resource on this subject today joining us, Dr. Mike Hutchins, an extension dairy specialist at the University of Illinois. I want to begin by thanking our guests for being here. Uh, Dr. Hudgens, uh, your presence is extremely valuable, and I think uh, your knowledge is going to bring some value to everybody watching today. So thanks for coming. Uh, I also want to welcome everybody and thank you for being here. And I certainly want to encourage you to interact with our speaker today. So during the presentation, I'd ask you to write your questions down in the chat and we will answer those questions at the end. So feel free and please, I encourage you to send those questions in. All right, without further ado, let's get down to business. So I'm gonna introduce Dr. Hutchins. Uh, Dr. Mike Hutchins earned his BS, MS, and his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. From 1971 to 79, he was in the role of an extension dairy specialist at the University of Minnesota, where he actually was able to coach the national champion uh, judging team at the 1978 World Dairy Expo. In 1979, he then moved to the University of Illinois, where he has been on faculty ever since. Uh, many of you have seen him speak. He's an incredibly uh, sought after speaker, giving 60 to 70 talks a year at different conferences in many states, and, and uh, he's spoken in 17 foreign countries. He's also been pretty selfless with his time. He was the president of the American Dairy Science Association from 2004 to 2005 and has been uh, recognized with many, many different awards, particularly in service of the dairy industry. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Hutchins to the virtual stage and uh, get started on his presentation. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bradford. And it's a pleasure to be on the program today. And, and it's certainly, as you point out, it's a very currently hot topic around the world with all livestock. And that simply is what do we, what do we do with these higher feed prices and those kinds of strategies? So let's go through uh, and give you some ideas. Hopefully I can encourage you to think about one or two things to go back to your farm or work with your clientele with on that. And of course, uh, Dr. Bradford, thank you for that kind introduction and also for uh, the group for sponsoring uh, today's uh, webinar. So I, I think we have choices. Uh, here are three of them that come to mind quickly. Number one, uh, we are going to have higher milk production with higher feed higher feed costs. Certainly that's one choice. Another choice, which scares me a little bit, and that is, well, let's just lower milk production and then lower feed costs. And yes, we have farmers in Illinois doing that, believe it or not. And the one that we really want to address today is number three, and that is trying to maintain or increase milk production while keeping lower feed costs as well. So let's look at some of our hip uh, tips. So of course, the, the, the one that comes to mind the quickest will be forage quality. Uh, forages in most cases are raised locally on the farm. Therefore, they are fairly economical sources of nutrients. In other words, in, in, at least in Illinois, about uh, the, the, the market price for forages are almost twice the cost of actually producing it on the farm. So when we talk about forage quality, here is your vocabulary. And that could make another whole webinar for another speaker another day. But certainly, we look at forage quality, we talk about particle size, especially in our silages. We're getting the right particle size for optimal rate of passage and digestibility, fragility. Uh, how fragility reflects how quickly does it break down in the rumen? A very important point. Of course, then comes uh, the three big uh, fiber numbers, uh, NDF and nutrient detergent fiber. Uh, that, that indicates usually uh, as that number goes up, quality goes down. NDF digestibility would be the next block over, and that indicates how digestible is that fiber as a source of energy for the rumen microbes. The UNDF, kind of a new term that we'll talk briefly about here today, that really reflects the fill factor in dairy cattle and, and can be used to your advantage for dry cows and older heifers, but for high producing cows, we really need to optimize dry matter intake. And then of course, you can put starch and sugar over in that next block. And then of course, if it's starch, how digestible is that starch? Because we know starch, digestibility varies a great deal. We'll see that here a bit later. 
And so the bottom line is, what is that cow response? What do my cows really respond to in terms of dry matter intake, eating behavior, and then of course, looking at milk yield, milk fat, milk protein, and lactose level as well. So certainly that's kind of one answer to these higher feed costs, and that is to increase the amount of forages in the diet, assuming we have adequate supplies and quality. This data comes from Dairyland Labs and looks at uh, the variation of neutral detergent fiber 30. Now that refers to the digestibility in 30 hours in the digestive tract. And I think there's two key, two or three take home messages. Number one, notice we have different forages here to the, the closer you are to the right. That means I have more uh, digestibility of that NDF fiber, therefore a better source of nutrients. Notice the far right, that is your low lignin corn silage, referred to as brown midrib by most people. That also applies to other forage resources, including some of the sorghums and the alfalfas. But you can see that that has a higher digestibility compared to the solid brown line, which is corn silage. And that, that difference is about six to eight units. Now, remember that number. Write it down. That's an important number you'll see here in, in, in just a minute. Then the next one you'll see over the green one is uh, basically legume, primarily alfalfa. And the point is that they have different levels that we expect to see in the feeding program and different shapes to the curve. Uh, notice how the alfalfa curve starts to, to bottom out a little bit, kind of not quite as distinct, which means there is more variation. We look down at the blue one. Why do we look at the blue one? Well, certainly here in Illinois, uh, the, the cover crops is a huge topic. Uh, some of the winter rye and trade kale and winter wheat, problems like that. And you can see that there really is no distinct peak, but there's a tremendous range. And of course, some of that is by design. In other words, if you want to make it more straw-like, you're going to go more to the left, using it for dry cows and older heifers. To go to the right, you can see it can be as good as. Uh, the low lignin uh, corn silages as well. So certainly tremendous ranges. And that's a take home message when we look at kind of what quits the quality of the forages on the farm. And so I thought I would just share you some new data that we just assembled here about two months ago. This is in the United States. This is, comes from, as you can see, Dairyland Labs, nearly 37,000 corn silage samples here uh, listed. And now you can compare how does your corn silage compare to this, 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 this regional lab value here. And you can see that it's uh, 2022 was a good year. Uh, you can see it compared to the previous years. And, and so it certainly has done very, very well. Notice our starch level is about 34%. Now that's a huge number because that means that starch I don't have to buy from corn right now. That's sitting around $6.40 a bushel here in Illinois right now in the, in the marketplace. So there you have guideline numbers. How does your corn silage measure up to this level here listed? And I will not read all those numbers to you. Uh, you, can have, uh, you can get access to these numbers a bit later if you wish. The next PowerPoint looks at the BMR. Now the BMR corn silage is out there on the right side. And the point you can see, if you come down four lines, you can see in, in bright, in, in, in Illinois orange, uh, Believe it or not, that doesn't look very orange to me, but that's what it is. But look at that NDF digestibility at 30 hours, eight units higher. And that's what we expect to see. That's powerful. And then you can also look down to the next line. That's a UNDF organic matter, which means we've taken out the ash contamination at 240 hours. That's kind of the standard. 30 hours for NDFD is pretty common. UNDF 240. And notice again, that number goes down uh, almost two units which means less of a fill factor. And that's why we see a lot of BMR corn silage being used in transition diets and early lactation diets when dry matter intake becomes an important factor. Unfortunately, that starch number you can see drifts down about one and a half units. And, and that is fairly common here in the Illinois, but that number is changing a little bit as you get better hybrids and different varieties available for us as well. So if you got BMR corn silage, how do you compare to this 2022 data and a snapshot that we have listed here? We then also had 18,000 alfalfa halide samples. Again, you can see good quality in 2022 here. Uh, notice, go to the bottom. That's my magic number in the bottom, RFQ. Relative Forage Quality Index, 162. And my guideline is, and Barry, I'm not sure what yours would be. I always say 150 or higher. That's what I want for my high producing dairy cows. We like RFQ because it's based on digestibility of the NDF. So it gives my grasses, especially higher quality grasses, a bit of a better shakeout compared to RFQ. 
V. And you'll see, and most labs are reporting both of them. Again, you can see my NDF digestibilities there right around that 49.1 number and uh, certainly a very similar to other years. In fact, maybe it's slightly higher, but of course, no statistics there as well. But again, a nice benchmark to compare. I always I traveled to the World Dairy Expo in October of this year at Madison, Wisconsin, and they always have their contests. These are producer uh, forages that are sent in the contest, and these are the winners. Notice alfalfa haylage, a really fancy material, almost too good for high producing cows. It almost feeds like a concentrate. Look at the RFQ, 277, phenomenal numbers. And the NDF digestibility at nearly equal to our corn silage numbers at 55. Look at my corn silage numbers. Again, uh, powerful numbers. Again, uh, the starch level in the sample that I actually saw, I took a picture of 42.4. And then if you look at the BMR, you can see uh, there the NDF digestibility up at 75.6. Uh, this uh, starts to rival a concentrate, basically, in terms of, uh, of, of the digestibility here in the diet. So you can see what some of the really elite dairy farmers in the United States and Canada are producing and potentially on your farm. And if you have these kinds of forages, it certainly gives you the opportunity to lower some of the costs of purchasing corn, soybean meal, canola, and those supplements as well. So here's my guideline. I'm saying I'll give you an A today that if your forage NDFD for legumes and grasses and small grains are over 50, over 50. And now you can see on corn silage, I want that number over 60. If it's BMR, probably over 65 at least. And that represents the energy coming from those cell wall products. The UNDF, which is your fill factor 240, which is 240 hours, I would like to have that below 5.3 pounds of UNDF for a 1,400 pound Holstein cow or a brown Swiss cow. And this kind of represents, can she eat enough of it? And this is a number you can actually calculate on your farm based on your forage test results and the, and, and the, and the pounds of dry matter from various sources of there. I think that's a very important number for our folks online with jerseys. That number gets down around four, a little more than four pounds. Primarily, this number comes from the Minor Institute by Dr. Rick Grant. Now, in some areas, we've had drought in the United States. About 50% of our cows are right now are in a drought-prone areas, and in that areas, sometimes we don't have quite the forage amounts we need. This comes out of the NASM, that's the NRC 2021. And so if you're going to be short on forages, and you should know that right now, that's an important take-home message. Uh, because if you don't discover this until April or May, uh, then it may be too difficult to, to, to make adjustments in the feeding program. But it simply shows that if you're going to decrease the amount of forage NDF, that's what that number on the left stands for, F is forage NDF. Most diets here in Illinois will be around 20, 21, 22% forage NDF. If you have really high quality forages, that number can actually come up close to 24 to 25% if you've got that really fancy forage. But notice as you feed less forage, if that number goes down, then NASM said you also have to increase the level of NDF. And that's primarily going to come from some of your byproduct feeds. For us here in Illinois, that'd be corn gluten feed. That'd be our magic feed. Uh, perhaps berry in Michigan, that could be beet pulp. If you're down in Florida, uh, that could probably be uh, citrus pulp in California. You might be looking at almond hulls. And then, of course, you're going to ratchet down the starch because as you decrease the forage NDF, that puts more pressure on the rumen itself. So powerful table. It says you just can't willy-nilly just play with these forages and just drop them in, drop them out. You've got to make sure the rest of the diet complements that forage feeding program. Another point we would talk about today in our, in our webinar is looking at evaluating uh, feed costs and feed ingredient sources here. And of course, uh, th this slide changes daily, unbelievably. Uh, right now, corn is actually uh, up a little bit. It went up yesterday for some odd reason, but $6.40 a bushel. I can remember back when we looked at $3.10 a bushel of corn and said, wow, uh, that's kind of expensive. Our soybean meal uh, here in Illinois will be summers around 420, the national average about 470. So soybean meal is quite expensive. And so that's another high input cost. And hey, is if you're buying it, uh, get your checkbook out. Uh, according to uh, Mike Rankin, uh, for 
premium quality hay, you're going to be looking at basically $280 or more a ton. So certainly these feed ingredients are expensive. So the question is, well, how, how, what is a good buy? And so what I do every month is go to uh, the Ohio State program called Sesame. Sesame, you will put in somewhere as 25 to 30 different feeds, and it compares all these feeds to each other in terms of nutrient content. In fact, one of the popular farm magazines, you can look at that on, uh, on a protein base, on a fiber base, and on a carbohydrate or energy base. And so certainly uh, you can really break this down. This one is kind of the overall comparison. And so this was December printout I just got last week. And you can see that corn, if it's in the green, it means it's a good price, which means compared to other feedstuffs, the break-even uh, a price is, uh, is $233 a ton. And currently it, it, it says uh, that it, it is, it's costing me uh, uh, five, uh, $255 a ton. So uh, I, I guess as I look at this, that probably should be uh, uh, in, in the red, actually, because it is basically overpriced. But what are you going to do? unless you're up in Canada and you have barley or some other uh, energy source available to you. So that actually is uh, corn is not a good buy, but you're kind of stuck there unless you've got corn silage. Uh, you'll notice a soybean meal currently is below the break-even price. Look at corn silage. What a deal. Uh, and that's why those of us in Illinois and perhaps Michigan and Wisconsin and Iowa, we feed lots of corn silage because you can see the current price is about $55 a ton. My farmers can probably raise that on farms here in Illinois for in the mid 30s and the breaking price $101. So that's why that's a really good price. Uh, notice uh, alfalfa, uh, the, the current price, if you use uh, 205, and that's pretty average quality alfalfa, the break even on that would be 255. If that was 265 or $80 a ton, it would not be such a good buy. A uh, soybean meal, this is your heat treated bypass. And I always use the table that looks at the availability of lysine and methionine in the feed stuff. And so that's why soybean meal heated becomes such a good buy because it's an excellent source of bypass lysine and some methionine as well. Right now in Illinois, a canola is not a good deal. It's in red. Hominy is a good price. And we do have supplies available here in Illinois. Perhaps the number you want to look at. So be well aware. My, my apologies for that. The shell corn should actually be in red as well. Here are some of the feeds that people are always talking about here in the Midwest. You can see corn distillers grain and corn gluten feed are good prices. I can remember when corn distillers grains was down around 150 a ton, but basically these products follow the price of corn. So not a big surprise that they are much more expensive now, but they are still relatively speaking a good buy. The soy hulls, uh, fuzzy cotton seed, wheat mints are not a good buy. And yet I love fuzzy cotton seed because it works so well in my corn silage based diets. But this gives you a feel for where you're at. You can also get this uh, uh, these numbers available from you on a regional basis here. So be well aware. It says on the top of the slide, Midwest U.S. So certainly these numbers would be different in Pennsylvania or California because of uh, the, the locality of where the feed is, transportation costs, and uh, some of those factors as well. So certainly this would be the Illinois numbers to take a look at. And in your area, it would probably be slightly different. The next concept we're looking at trying to uh, uh, deal with higher feed prices is what I call precision nutrient feeding. And this is my definition, but that simply means that I am trying to uh, get the exact amount of nutrients to my cows based on their gestation and lactation stage. And to do that, I need to have a rumen model. Uh, I'm using the new NASM uh, 2021 model. I used to use uh, the Spartan 3 program uh, years ago. Uh, there are other ones out there as well. Uh, uh, that come from Cornell. And th th this allows me to, to take and have the computer model digestibility of nutrients, uh, dry matter intake, rates of passages, fill factors, uh, all those things come into play in building those diets as far as that goes. It also predicts fairly accurately the level of metabolizable protein. That's what MP stands for, metabolizable protein. And of course, all of you online know that's made up of the rumen undegraded uh, protein sources, such as the heat treated soy and some of the corn byproducts. And of course, microbial protein sources. More about that in just a minute. I think the big one is a third bullet item. And this is something that's really a challenge here in Illinois. What our average herd size of 180 cows 
you'll, you'll see that we'd really like to get groups of cows. There's some tremendous opportunities out there in terms of building rations if I can target these groups of cows. And then, of course, avoid excessive nutrients. And that's the power of the model. Uh, in other words, it will really accurately predict metabolizable protein, amino acid flow as well, which is going to be really important. And of course, some of those nutrients can be quite expensive as listed there at the bottom. So let's just take a look at that. This is an uh, example of carbohydrates. I have a parallel uh, one for protein, but because of today's timing, we're just going to use this one. And I'm not going to walk you through it. This one is adapted from the Hordes Feeding Guide on Holstein's 1,500-pound Holstein cows. And uh, you, you can see here that we are now looking at uh, dry matter intakes across the line. And uh, those are in kilograms. So you'll just have to multiply those by two uh, to get them over to, to pounds. Uh, but what I want you to see is look as you go across the top. Far off, close up dry cows, fresh, early, mid and late lactation cows. And if you look at NDF levels, just, just look at that. Notice how those numbers change. As those numbers get high, that means they are lower in energy for far off dry cows and close up dry cows. You can see late lactation cows can tolerate more NDF in the diet. Look at starch, at the starch numbers. And notice you can see again. So if you're feeding a one group TMR, which means those last four blocks on the right are getting all the same ration. And therefore you can see we'll be wasting or certainly investing more starch than those cows have to have there. And we have sugar and this same concept applies to uh, the protein dynamics as well. So certainly if you can get cows in that, and I know if you've got 180 cows or 200 cows, how do you get that done? And, and I, I think that's the challenge on precision feeding is can you somehow uh, through some type of electronic grain feeding system or some type of a grouping system or housing system where you can get these various groups available out there on the dairy farm. And of course, the key number here, not only is the percent of those nutrients, it's the dry matter intake. Because remember, cows don't eat percentages. They eat pounds of protein or, or pounds of starch out there in the feeding program. Another one that we'll talk about briefly here as we look at another option, and that is your friend, and that is that rumen fermentation. And the good news is that uh, the rumen bacteria are not in the union, so we don't have to give them a minimum of a wage, as we would say here. But remember that we can get a roughly about 65% of the amino acids needed by, uh, needed by your dairy cows from bacterial sources. And the good news is that is almost an ideal amino acid profile. When you look at what's in milk or what's in meat or tissue and versus what in, in the microbes, uh, great, great, great balance. And of course, uh, they go right down to the lower tract to be absorbed intact as those sources of amino acid. One number I thought was useful come in the new NASM uh, booklet or book, you should say, and that is looking at rumen degraded protein levels around 10%. And that would include uh, far off, close up dry cows. And that's important because many of those diets will have straw or lower quality fill factors in them, and they will not have much uh, rumen degraded protein. So it's not uncommon to see a small amount of urea in those feeding programs to meet that 10% number. If the number gets over 10%, then you're going to end up wasting some of these proteins. And that becomes a very powerful number. And that's why we see about two thirds of our forage dry matter in Illinois as corn silage and one third legume grass, small grains, because it has too much. Those other forages have too much a rumen, a degraded protein, especially if it's been ensiled uh, and, and fermented through a fermentation program. Second of all, those rumen microbes, they can produce about 70% of the energy coming from carbohydrates, such as the NDFs, your starches, your sugars. So, and, and those, those, those VFAs become extremely powerful in terms of providing sources of glucose coming from propionic acid and making milk fat coming from acetate primarily and some butyrate as well. So certainly uh, we can get a huge amount of our nutrients coming off of these VFAs and these uh, microbial amino acid sources here. And of course, one of the key factors is, and that's why we are very concerned about the physical form of these forages, and that is looking for signs of serum. 
Sarah stands for subacute rumen acidosis, and that is usually defined as hours below a rumen pH below 6.0. Some universities use 5.8. So again, we want to make sure that we got this rumen really, I use the word cooking for me, because it can really produce some extremely high quality amino acids and rumen volatile fatty acids as energy sources for my cows. This table comes right out of the, the new NASM book as well. And it simply shows the dynamics of uh, corn ingredients. And so what you have here basically are uh, four different kinds of corn, shell corn, and then the last one is corn screenings. And the point is that while uh, they all the top four have the same amount of starch, 70.4% starch found in shell corn, if you grind it uh, coarsely, medium or fine, notice I can increase the energy content by about 15%. And so do you have your corn or your barley, whatever grain source you have in the right proper particle of processing form so that it's available? I like my thumb rule is about 70% of the starch is going to go in uh, in rumen fermentation and make volatile fatty acids and to optimize amino acid uh, production and uh, control uh, rumen ammonia levels. The last one is corn screenings. Uh, just be careful. You'll see that the energy content is lower there because uh, it contains less starch. And of course, you've got to be very careful. It's a quite variable product. But in some locations, you may find that being a quote unquote goodbye. And also be well aware that if there's any microtoxins, which we're not seeing much of this year, Barry, here in the Midwest, uh, would be another concern with the corn screenings. So th that's the other take home message. Did you write it down? Am I processing not only my forages correctly, but now even my, my, my energy source grain here, in this case, corn. This also comes right out of NASM as well. This simply shows you other corn products. Uh, you can see that uh, one that's uh, in interesting uh, here in the Midwest is called snaplage. means that uh, my large uh, com uh, my, uh, uh, corn choppers or processors can go in the field and actually snap the ear, the husk, and maybe a little bit of the, the, the plant material going in. And you can see now, instead of being 70% starch, it drops down to 56. We have seen snaplage with varying anywhere from 50 to 60% starch, depending on how clean that unit is doing and collecting that material as well. You can see the energy contents reflect that. There's corn and cob meal. That means uh, no husk. No other plant parts is basically the cob and the grain. And again, you can see 62.1% starch is a typical number coming out of the book. There's your hominy. Again, hominy can vary a bit from its source. Somewhere is around 50, 55% of starch in the feeding program. And then look at the bottom line. Nothing we can do in December about the bottom line. But take a look at that. You can see corn size chart harvested at three different stages of maturity as reflected by dry matter. And you can see a take-home message there that as the crop becomes more mature, we end up getting more starch. So the question is, are you optimizing corn size harvest in the fall or in the, or depending where this, we're listening from right now, I know in, in Brazil for now, where it's summer down there. The question is, are you, are you leaving some starch in the field that you're not capturing because you're chopping the corn size at a less mature state as well? Yes, the NDF is changing. So it becomes more straw-like, but the starch becomes the real driver in this situation as well. Another take-home message in terms of starch dynamics. Well, Barry, let's go then to another area that's going to be important. That's what I'm going to call feed bunk management. Certainly it says, can do my cows really have access to the feed? And here are some nice guidelines. Uh, in terms of space, 30 inches of feed bunk space for each cow. Uh, you say, well, they're out there 24 hours a day. Well, they, they all tend to eat at the same time, especially lactating cows coming out of the milking parlor. Well, that would be 75, roughly 75 centimeters so that cows have access to the feed rather than have to wait or go lay down and then come back and eat when they should. The next one is a bit controversial, and that is the, the, the targeted way back. Uh, some of my dairymen feed an empty bunk. I think that's a mistake because it means if cows out there have a drive to eat more dry matter, that means they would they can't eat it because it's not there. So I suggest one or two percent of uh, the initial feeding. So if I'm feeding my cows uh, basically uh, 50 pounds of dry matter on average to each cow, I'm hoping to have a half to a pound of that 
TMR left there when the feeding period over in 24 hours. So cows have access to that there. Uh, if feed prices are less expensive, which they are not now, I'll increase that number up to two to 4%. But with high feed prices and certainly favorable milk prices, I'm going to, I'm going to cut that down to a bit of a smaller number. Notice in my uh, close-up and fresh cow groups, I want that number at 3 to 5% way back to encourage as much dry matter into those groups as I can get into them. Another important thing is to feed fresh diet at a consistent time. So if cows normally get TMRs at 7 in the morning and at, uh, at uh, 3 in the afternoon, that they need to get it at those same times, and the number should be within 30 minutes of those target times. Ideally, after each milking. So if you are milking three times a day in a perfect world, I would be dropping fresh feed in front of those cows after each milking. I didn't say you have to mix it every time. I may have some residue carryover in the in my TMR mixer to put that third feeding in front of them. What about pushing up feeds? Uh, the new research says push up feeds one hour before milking because in some cases cows cannot reach that feed. And they'll eat that before coming in the parlor. And then every two to four hours after milking should optimize uh, responses from cows. And then re remove the wayback. So in other words, a clean plate, remove that from in front of those cows uh, and push it out. There's some pretty good research showing that that will increase dry matter intake by one or two pounds because the cows don't have old feed, stale feed, hot feed, fermented feed, or anything like that in front of them. So certainly the other aspect I thought I'd put up here, and that is looking for signs of sorting. Uh, that uh, basically, uh, if you look at the feed punk, if I took my Penn State box out there, and that's a great tool, I would expect, hopefully, if it's not sorted, that all three or four boxes are within plus or minus 5% of the original TMR that was presented to the cows. Uh, signs of uh, sorted feeds, uh, a little tougher to see, but you'll see that in some farms. Uh, more long particles remain in the feed than what was delivered there. If the cows are forming pockets, bare concrete, or bare uh, surfaces in the feed bunk, if they're nestling or pushing the feed bunk, instead of attacking and eating feed, they're, they're picking and choosing as far as that goes. Uh, one thing I like to do is to go down and take my fingernails and, and run them across uh, the, 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 the bottom of the feed bunk. And if you get a, a, a residue underneath your feed bunk, I encourage you to smell that. You may discover that's not very pal palatable type factor out there in the, in the in the feeding program. And then we'd like to have a good, clean, residue-free surface. That could be a plastic liner. It could be a tiled surface. It could be epoxy painted surface. Keep it very, very clean. And the one that we aren't going to talk about today is obviously the shrink. And, and shrink can be six or eight percent of feed, and that becomes another really important factor in feed bunk management. That's another topic for another time. Finally, uh, let's look at this one. This is what I call a transition feeding approach. And today I'm simply going to look at two uh, two programs. I think I don't care if I've got a hundred cows or a thousand cows. I want to have a two tiered transition feeding program, which means a close up. Uh, a close-up dry cow program where I can increase the nutrient density, uh, both protein and energy here for the formation of uh, colostrum for a rapidly growing calf inside that cow. And also because they tend to eat a little less dry matter here. And then I need a fresh cow program. And uh, there's lots of good discussions and guidelines on that. We'll do that maybe in another webinar a bit later. But certainly a fresh cow program becomes critical here and to allow me to step up the feeding programs to allow the rumen microbe and dry matter intake to adjust accordingly and also to monitor cow health, make sure I have healthy cows. I thought I would share one of the really hot topics right now here in the U.S., and that is plasma calcium. So <clears throat> this is some data that comes from the University of Wisconsin by Dr. Gary Essel's group there. And the yellow bar simply shows that is when the cow is going to calve. The red line you just saw pop up there, that is what I call a cut point. It says once that line goes, the blood goes below that red line, that call, cows are low in blood calcium, also known as hypocalcemia. And then we'll take a look at cows that get milk fever in the red line. And you can see they drop way down here. You will have to intervene with those cows usually giving them an IV calcium solution. Otherwise, they will die. And so that would be uh, milk fever. Typically, around uh, 1 to 3% would be a normal number on, on farms. And here comes the green line. This is your hypocalcemic cow. 
And you can see right here on these that these cows start dropping about one day before calving. And they drop down. And now the question is, how quickly do they recover? If they recover in one day, that's good news. About 30 to 35% of my cows are going to experience this drop here. Most cows will drop at some level here. The Cornell researchers say that if this cow recovers and within 24 hours to 36 hours, she's home free. Uh, if they don't drop at all below this 8.2 or 8.0, whichever line you're going to be using here, they are also going to be healthy cows. It's these cows here that drop down and do not recover for three or four days. That is where you're going to intervene probably with boluses or drenches or some other source out there in the program as well. And it certainly becomes a challenge as well. We are hoping to see in the next year or two a cow side calcium test, which means you could actually predict, should I intervene on this cow or can I wait with her to see if she's going to respond normally? You have two uh, tools in your arsenal for hypocalcemia, as I see it. One is the anionic products uh, out there in the program. There are several great commercial products we have available to us right now that do not decrease dry matter intake significantly here. And then, of course, we've got the calcium supplementation right at calving using the boluses, paste, or, or drench products. Uh, we're going to say more about the DCAD product. You're going to be looking at uh, values somewhere around uh, 6 to 5.5 for Holsteins there. And you're going to be looking at a total level of calcium somewhere around uh, 150, 180 total grams of calcium. Uh, got an extra parenthesis, parenthesis sign that shouldn't be there. And then we move on to my calcium supplementation program. And generally, we're delivering every 12 hours, if feasible, 50 to 60 grams of a supplemental calcium source here, made up typically of calcium chloride, which is a rapidly available calcium source, calcium sulfate, which is a slower uh, source of calcium, and calcium propane, another excellent source, but not only brings calcium, but a source of blood glucose uh, by the liver from propionate, from propionate being fed. And as we said, every 12, 24 hours. These are excellent tools. And most of my uh, dairy farmers are looking at managing blood uh, calcium using these two tools. Now, the question is how much calcium should be in the close-up ration? And these are four different examples. Over on the far left side would be a, a recommendation coming from uh, University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School. Less than 40 grams. That would be the low calcium diet. You're trying to turn on that diet uh, to these cows. Uh, the, hypo, uh, the, the parathyroid hormone to regulate blood calcium, uh, especially as they get into the, the freshening window. Uh, the NRC number, if you look up in the book, that's what they have for dry cows, 50 to 60 grams. If you're on a DCAD diet, there are two choices. One is called partially acidification. That would be in kind of the gold color here. And that means those pH is going to be between six and seven. And you're going to add, uh, if you're feeding 60, 70 grams here, you're going to add an extra 25 or 30 grams to these cows. If they are fully acidified, which means you're going down to a slightly lower pH here, more product, a little bit more cost, I understand. Now you're going to raise the calcium levels up to about 150 total grams in the feeding program. And that's based on some work from the University of Illinois. So those are your four choices. And your veterinarian, your in consultant will probably have a program they would recommend to you. Uh, here at Illinois, we are going to go fully acidified, primarily because it's going to be a little more room that if there's a change in the cation, be it potassium or sodium in the feeding program, my cows are protected. So that pH is going to be around uh, right around 6 and Jersey around 5.5. I'm going to be at these higher levels of calcium. This is an important point. And here's a challenge because, again, my smaller herd struggle with that. And that, 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 that the, 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 the virgin heifers calving the first time, they do not need decad. In fact, the research from the University of Florida indicates a meta-analysis that these heifers giving a decad will produce lower levels of milk and a decrease in dry matter intake. So if it's possible, if you can keep the, the, the heifers away from the older cows on these decad diets, that's a plus. And of course, uh, a testing program allows you to really evaluate where you're at. My last point here, and then we'll get to the second phase of my presentation, is the heifer enterprise. And I think this is really important because uh, heifers are not a profit center like they were, say, five to seven years ago. Uh, right now it, in Illinois, it costs us roughly $2,200 to raise a heifer, uh, depending on what you put in for feed costs. This includes uh, two years and investment costs 
death loss, all those things come into play, lack of fertility. Right now, the good news is heifers have come up two or $400 in some of our marketplaces here, but still sitting around fifteen to $1,600 for a replacement heifer. So the question is, how many heifers do you have and what are the quality? And so I would challenge all of you to think about the uh, genomics. A genomics allows you to identify the best genetics in your herd, and then you can breed sexed semen to predict what 90% of these animals will give you a heifer calf. And these should be extremely high quality, genetically superior, and that would include cows and heifers to use the sex semen on. The new research says that even young cows breed well to sex semen. Uh, then breed the bottom third of the herd to beef, usually it's Angus or one of the other uh, beef breeds. And right now in Illinois, I can get a premium of anywhere as $150, $200 over uh, the value of a, of a Holstein bull calf and another $40, $50 in addition if it was, happens to be a Holstein heifer based on the, the reports we get every week here. So here's your take-home message. How many heifers do you have to have? And usually you can calculate based on such things as uh, calf losses in the first uh, pre-wean calves, uh, how many heifers are infertile, you can't get pregnant, what is your cull rate on the farm, what is your turnover rate, and is your herd going to stay stable, and then add 10% to that number. And in most farms in Illinois, even today, we are still feeding too many heifers, and that is costing me money and some expensive feed inputs as well. So Barry, let's wrap up and let's look at what are some of the tools that you can use on your farm. Uh, we talk about these different strategies. What are some of the tools that can really help us out? My favorite tool is feed efficiency. Feed efficiency is simply defined as of the pounds of fat corrected or energy corrected milk per pound of feed intake. And this table simply allows you and I to say, if I've got, for example, uh, my herd is averaging 70 pounds of milk, then that feed efficiency on all cows should be 1.44. Notice as these herds increase in production, and this data from The Ohio State University, you can see now 90 pounds, and that's fairly common in our best herds now in the Midwest, that feed efficiency goes up to 1.63. So I love the tool because it allows each farmer to look at his groups of cows or his entire herd to answer the question, are they consuming the amount of dry matter they should be getting there. So I'm not feeding them too much dry matter because that's going to cost me money or they're not eating enough to support the levels of milk I want to achieve. And so the question is, why is that important? Because there's dollars on the table. And this table simply looks at the economics of feed efficiency. And so I'm using 70 pounds of milk, keeping that constant at 16 cents per, per pound. That should be pound of dry matter. My apologies there, 16 cents per pound of dry matter. And now you can see that most of my herds are going to be in that 1.4 to 1.5. Through management, through uh, feeding programs, uh, ration building, if I can go from 1.4 to 1.5, get that same 70 pounds of milk, I save 53 cents more income per cow per day. So I haven't dropped my feed cost, but I've increased my profitability margin. And that's a powerful tool. If you're at 1.3 and went to 1.5, that's a big step. Now you'd be over an extra dollar per cow per day. And that is big dollars. So I love the feed efficiency tool. Second tool, measuring milk profitability. So remember, I only get to set that milk curve once. And so they only peak at one time in the lactation curve. Generally for older cows, 40 to 60 days after calving, first lactation heifers 80 to 90 days to 100 days after, but that sets the lactation curve. And there's all kinds of research that says, once you get that curve established, if you can maintain that curve, that makes more milk production. And as we just saw, high producing cows are most efficient. And finally, I don't give up milk. My point is I don't give up milk. So that, that, that second point when we started the webinar, uh, less milk, less feed costs, bad news. Because I look at what I call marginal dry matter. And this is that last pound. That's why I don't want that empty bunk out there. That last pound of dry matter intake that cow consumes. Remember, she's paid all my maintenance costs. That pound of dry matter costs 16 cents. If I'm using milk at 24 cents a pound or $24 a hundred, depending on your marketplace and the components, one pound of dry matter should support two pounds of milk. 
And that means that one pound of dry matter will cost me 16 cents and I make 32 cents a cow a day on that last pound of dry matter intake in my high producing or my lactating cows on the feeding program. So certainly that's going to be important as well. And certainly milk components become a big factor. This comes out of the Hordes Dairyman yearly summary. And you can see the Holstein cows. How are you doing? This number is raised the last two or three years. Holstein used to be 3.6, 3.7. Now they're 4.0. The other breeds really haven't changed very much in terms of fat. Protein has not changed much either. But the question is, are your Holsteins or your jerseys or your brown Swiss, are you meeting the breed averages? These are DHIR values that come out in 2022 from the various breed associations. And this simply shows you uh, pounds of fat and protein. So I take the same five breeds and I calculate the pounds of fat and protein divided here by uh, 365. You can see that my Holstein cows, uh, and this is the uh, two, uh, this is the uh, uh, 2X uh, 300 and uh, mature equivalent milk. That's about 5.5 pounds pound of, of uh, fat and protein per day. And the, the magic number is six. If you can get, uh, so you can go home right now. And if your herd is averaging 80 pounds of milk, then you take your fat and protein test and multiply that uh, to uh, with the 80 pounds of milk. If you're over six pounds, hooray for you. One of our really elite herds in Illinois averaging over 102 pounds of milk. Uh, they are averaging 7.2 pounds of fat and protein. And right now, um, uh, the November price on milk fat Three dollars and thirty-seven cents. That one is getting softer now because of the holiday season and butter uh, prices are starting to shift down a little bit. Milk protein is coming up two dollars and fifty-four cents, and that really mirrors my cheese production as well. So these are very valuable, and about eighty-five percent of the milk in the United States is based on uh, pounds of fat and protein. In other countries would be kilograms of fat and protein. Here's some benchmarks for Illinois. Notice it says Illinois for 2023. Uh, there is my feed cost per cow per day, and that's based on our current feed prices. There's that 16 cents. And you can see at 80 pounds of milk versus 70 pounds of milk, uh, my feed costs go up if I give less, if I, I get less milk. So basically, I don't want to shortchange my good cows here. My income feed cost also uh, goes down, and we need about $11 to $11.50 to cover all my other costs. So right now, there is a small profitability sitting, obviously, in the dairy sector here in Illinois. And there's my feed efficiency numbers uh, that we talked about earlier, and you can, again, do some math there. Nice benchmarks. So again, as listeners, how do you compete? What are your numbers? What do they look like? And those are the big four. Cost per pound of dry matter. The cost of putting grocery in front of your cows. What does it cost to produce 100 pounds of milk? And that one is really driven on milk yield. Income over feed costs. Now, this reflects the profitability of the entire farm enterprise. And the feed efficiency simply says, are your cows effectively converting uh, feed dry matter in, into milk? Kernel processing score. Another useful tool. Uh, this data just came in from one of our labs. You can see this is the 21-22 cropping year. And you can see a kernel processing core on corn on silages. Uh, you should be in the green. Got to be over 70. In fact, the new research says you should probably be over 75. And so you can see, if you look at this chart, about half the corn silage samples sent into this lab uh, were at, at an optimal level. And another half were basically a better job could be done. And so you might ask, well, why is that important? And you can see there, there are thousands of samples here. And the answer is because Randy Shaver in Illinois did some research. And he said, <clears throat> if you go from basically 50, and this is 50 uh, basically to, to, to 70 or 60 to uh, 50, uh, 50, this would be 60, this would be 70. So you can see that the difference between these two points is about two pounds more milk. That means I extract more milk because the starch is more available to the cow in the digestive tract. And that means two pounds more milk or a, saving a pound of corn. So if your kernel processing score is not up at one of these higher numbers, like up here at 70, then you're going to have to either buy another pound of corn, which is going to cost you uh, to, at today's market, or take less milk. So you got to be there to get that job done. Fecal starch is another test that can be done. And again, this is catching on. Let's take a look at some results. This is the work that comes from the University of Pennsylvania several years ago. 
uh, by Jim Ferguson. And this is the research in which these are the apparent start to adjustability. This would be 70%, 80%, 90%, 100%. Notice you never get to 100. There's always some starch that's not available, usually tied to the lignin part of the plant. And you can see that as we see fecal starches approaching uh, 4%, you can see that the starch adjustability is dropping below 90%. That's the magic number, 3%. 3% or less. And several of the farms that run, that I've worked with here, they're getting down around 2% or even less. So look at this. You can see a number of farms here. These are different research studies or groups of cows. So these are controlled research studies in which they could actually measure the amount of starch in the diet compared to the amount of starch appearing in the feces. Now remember that because here you can see this uh, example here. You can see corn in the feces. When you can see these cracked corn, these pieces of corn with starch associated, I'm guessing this is 6 to 8% fecal starch. And so certainly uh, this shows you, again, the fecal starch numbers here uh, on this. Here's that cut point of five. These are University of Wisconsin guidelines. And again, you can see these counts here on 6,000 samples. You can see a number of these samples are over 5 to 10%. And so you might ask, well, why is that a big concern? And the answer is, it says that if fecal starch can be dropped by one percentage point, for example, yours is 6% and you discovered that you could get that down to uh, 3% by grinding your corn finer. That's three percentage units drop in fecal starch. The research says that's 0.6 pounds more milk. That's almost two pounds more milk that we are extracting again from the manure. So it's that same reflection with as we had with kernel processing. And that is to extract, uh, make that starch more available in the digestive tract to my cows. So Barry, let's wrap this up here. We've uh, we used my uh, full uh, 45, 50 minutes uh, webinar time here. And hopefully we have uh, time for a few more questions here. What's my take home messages? Number one, we talked about the available tools. Uh, this could include uh, the fecal starch, it include feed efficiency. You could put milk urea nitrogen on this list here. Uh, you know, a body condition scoring. All these things become very useful tools to say, where are my nutrients going? Am I capturing those nutrients that are being presented to the cow in the feeding program? Number two, when we look at this topic of uh, success, cost of success, dealing with high feed prices, control the controllable costs. In other words, uh, I can't change the price of milk. I can't change the price of diesel or gasoline, but I can control the feed processing program diets and manipulations itself. Number three, you want to optimize milk yield. And I like the word optimize. Uh, some of you may say maximize. Some cases, uh, maximum milk has to be careful. You're not just buying the milk through feed nutrients and really watch the components. Most markets are going to be paid some value on components, uh, especially on milk fat. And most markets in the U.S. are now paying for milk protein as well. And the last point is from a colleague of mine that he mentioned two years ago, and I think it's good. He said, you may not be able to save your way to profitability. In other words, uh, lowering cutting feed costs, limiting dry matter intake, and therefore uh, save money on feed end, but then lose it on the milk end. So Barry, we will stop there and see if we have any questions. I'm going to uh, click out of my program here, escape, and uh, go back to you and uh, turn the program back to you to wrap up. Well, thank you, Dr. Hutchins. Great job, as always. One thing I like about your presentation is um, I think it's easy in a commodity business to get focused on just frustration with rising input costs and seems like milk never keeps up, or at least it's easy to get in that mindset, but you really helped us focus on, focus on, you know, what you can manage. Like you, it doesn't do any good to complain about prices, right? So it's, think about what, what you can do about it. So a couple, we have a number of questions here. I don't think we have time for all of them. There's some good ones that I'd like to bounce off you. Um, one was mentioning the drought in the Western Corn Belt this year. That's really uh, made grain prices skyrocket in the regionally, you know, in that level, it's even more extreme than what we've seen uh, across the country. What are the best strategies to maintain milk yield and give cows the, the energy they need in that sort of environment? Well, I, I think, Barry, that's a, that's a very uh, fair question to ask. Uh, everybody has slightly different strategies at this point. Uh, if if uh, 
take a look to see what 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 is the the, the profitability of the co commodities that are out there at this point. Uh, if here in Illinois, uh, we are not facing with that problem. But if you're out in Kansas, for example, uh, certainly you may look at uh, are there any ec economical forage pr uh, buys out there? I, I know uh, that might be a possibility. It's too late now, but you may be able to find sources on farms that can buy forages. The byproduct feeds become, a, uh, for me, a, a, a real opportunity as far as that goes. I think, Barry, the real key is to, to plan now. Uh, we're not going to harvest it uh, in Kansas or the Western Corn Belt, uh, any, anything in the next three or four months. If we're lucky, they got a cover crop sitting there, which is uh, becoming a big issue, uh, opportunity. And that means that crop's going to come out fairly early, probably in April. And that might be an opportunity to work those in and, and harvest them at, at the right time. So I think you kind of look around and see what's, what's available uh, and, and what is the most economical place to be and still meet the nutrient needs of those animals on the farm. Good answer. Yeah, I, you did a nice job of demonstrating the Sesame tool, which is, is one of those tools that you can use to think outside the box, so to speak. One other question I wanted to bounce off you. I see, you know, I live in a peninsula, so the, the basis issue is even bigger maybe than some other places. But um, with growing costs of transportation and even just finding truck drivers, um, I'm seeing more and more interest in on-farm uh, grinding uh, on farm roasting for soybeans, things like that. Do you think that's a trend that's going to continue? Yeah, I, I think certainly here in Illinois, we see a lot of that because almost all my farms, since they're modestly small in cow numbers, we have some big ones, of course, uh, yep. they actually have corn and soybeans to sell. So that's an excellent resource that uh, they can, uh, if they grind those corn properly, and, and of course, uh, uh, the old thumb rule was don't make pig feed. Well, the answer is you are going to make pig feed, yep. uh, especially with our TMI rations here. Roasted soybeans, if they're done well, can right. be very, very effective as well. So certainly th those would be great uh, choices as far as that goes here uh, to maximize uh, those those resources as well uh, back when uh, we had a much better price on corn and gluten feed we had farmers discovering they could sell corn and buy back gluten and still make a good diet and make some money on that transfer assuming yeah. the truckings were there and of course the mississippi river was high enough to transport them as well uh, barry i want to make one more point because i am uh, not sure where it fit in but i just saw that the uh, dairy marginal program has been expanded extended to december 31st so i mean our u.s dairy farmers every one of you should be signed up because uh, it covers a really nice program for uh, 200 250 cows on the farm and and it's a great program and it's been paying off now uh, they said in 2022 it wouldn't pay off it has mm -hmm. There's been no way out of four months and the projection according to one farm magazine every month in 2023 is going to pay off so that's a program that's available that uh, i think our dairy farmers just have to look at as we get squeezed because if we look at that the future milk prices look like they're projected to go down about a dollar, dollar and a half, a hundred. And uh, feed prices aren't going to change probably until April or May, depending again on, on what happens uh, uh, in the planting season. So again, uh, just a, a point there. It's a very good point. Thank you. And I totally agree with you. So Dr. Hutchins, again, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Done a great job of pulling together relevant and timely information on the impacts of these high feed prices on dairy production. And then importantly, the, what are the best strategies to consider for maintaining profitability? So we're really grateful for your contribution. Thank you, Barry. It's been a pleasure and honor. Happy holidays to everybody out there as well. You as well. So on behalf of the WiseNetics team, I also want to thank everyone for attending the webinar and for your participation. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions, uh, but I also want to thank the people who are backstage who make a big contribution to disseminating this information on uh, optimal dairy farming. So to wrap up, I also want to invite you to follow the Dairy Podcast Show, which I help host on all platforms, uh, where we bring you cutting edge insights straight from the brightest minds in the global dairy industry right to your ears. So the Dairy Podcast Show's website is available in the chat. It's just www.dairypodcastshow.com. So again, Dr. Hutchins, thank you so much. And until next time, everyone, have a good day and a Merry Christmas.